Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for your mercy, your love, your grace, your forgiveness, all the, the riches that we've been bestowed upon in Christ. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is the Wednesday night uh, sovereign, sovereignty of God. We're focused on the sovereignty of our gracious God. Psalm 65, O thou that hearest prayer unto thee, shall all flesh come, iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. I have on rare occasion talked about a question that seems to bother a lot of Christians. In fact, it's, it's kind of split Christian communities time and time again. And that's the discussion of the free will of man. It's a hot topic. It's a hot, one hot potato. I suggested to you folks that we could settle that very quickly because the expression doesn't make any sense. There is no such thing as free will. So when someone says, how do you reconcile the free will of man with the sovereignty of God? You have a problem because they have presumed something that isn't true. A man does not have free desires, and I thought that we kind of settled that in the, the first study, and then we didn't, and kind of I thought maybe, well, we did that, we settled it in the second and third and fourth study, and we didn't, and uh, I didn't just, that so didn't work out too good. Freedom is something that doesn't exist when it comes to our desires. You're not free to desire what you don't desire, and that to me is basic, and it ought to be intuitively obvious to anyone who thinks about it. Dearly beloved, the definition of the word will is desire. That's what it is. I didn't make that up. You look it up in the dictionary, and that's what it means. Will means desire, and you have desires that are conditioned by something other than freedom. And you may suggest if you want, or you may loudly boast that you are free to desire whatever you want to desire, and that doesn't make any sense. That's circular reasoning. Of course you're free to desire what you desire. The question is, you're not free to desire what you don't desire. Therefore, you cannot speak of the freedom of desire. The only thing that you're free to desire is what you desire. I mean, that's, that's some freedom, isn't it? And I, I thought that we had kind of settled that in, in hundreds of discussions. Several people have contacted me. Well, aren't we then free as new creations in Christ? And so I thought that uh, we'd take uh, just a moment to try to put this all in perspective if we can. If I'm not thinking clearly, then we're going to, uh, well, then I'm going to muddy the waters more, and I hope that doesn't happen. First of all, I want us all to understand scripturally there is flesh and there is spirit. In Matthew 26, the Lord said to his disciples, he, he went aside to pray, he came back and he found them sleeping, and he told them that they ought always to watch and pray, that the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, without going to any Old Testament scriptures, 
the Lord made that statement in each of the Gospels clearly indicating that there is flesh and there is spirit. In the third chapter of John, you all know the story. Nicodemus comes to Christ by night, says, Rabbi, we know that you've been sent from God. It's intuitive, intuitively obvious to us because anybody who hasn't been sent from God couldn't do what you do. You know, giving sight to the blind, uh, raising the dead, and whatever. So we know that you're sent from God. And the Lord Jesus Christ had some basic discussions with Nicodemus that night. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And once again, we have a clear indication in the Word of God that there is flesh and there is spirit. And we know that those who are born of the Spirit are born by the Spirit. In John chapter 6, verse 63, it is the Spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. Now listen, folks, to the power of that verse and put that in the framework of modern evangelism. It is the spirit that quickens, the flesh profits nothing. So can I then offer an invitation to the flesh and say, now you're all flesh, but if you would come and accept, believe, receive, repent, or, or, or God, knows who, God knows what, you would suddenly become spirit. What you're doing, folks, is you are suggesting that the flesh profits something and the Word of God says the flesh profits nothing. Nothing good comes out of the flesh. Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which, which are these, adultery, fornication, uh, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, you know, all of you. You know them all as well as I do. There aren't any good ones there. There is not one single verse of Scripture that in any way would support anything good coming out of the flesh. We are told, for example, in Proverbs, Proverbs 21.4, that the plowing of the wicked is sin. The work of the wicked is sin. What's your job? Well, I do welfare work among the needy in my community. I carry them food. I, I get them medicine. I help them. Uh, but is that person a new creation in Christ? No. Then what he's doing is sin. The work of the wicked is sin. Well, no, no, no. That, that can't be. He's, he's doing a lot of good. The plowing of the wicked is sin. The work of the wicked is sin. Here's a guy didn't believe in heaven, didn't believe in hell, didn't believe in anything. He looks around trying to find somebody with a problem. Somebody was robbed, somebody was in a car wreck, somebody was sick, somebody's, I don't know, somebody's husband died, somebody's wife died, somebody's kid died. He picks one of these people out. He goes to their address. He finds their address. He goes there. He knocks on the door. He says, here's $200. I hope you can use it. And he leaves. Never gives them his name. Doesn't write them a check. It just makes him feel good. It's a good deal, right? Dearly beloved, the work of the wicked is sin. Nothing good comes out of the flesh. In Proverbs chapter 21, your Bible isn't, isn't going to say this, so I'm going to interpret it for you. The worship of the wicked 
is sin. Now, what it says in your Bible is the sacrifice of, of the wicked is sin. And what he's talking about there is worship. Their worship of God is sin in the flesh. Now, it becomes extremely interesting, in fact, thrilling to me, I, I hope it is to you, that never, ever, ever does God call you wicked. Never. Never does God call you a sinner. He doesn't do that. What He calls you is a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's not ashamed to call you brethren. But He doesn't call you sinner, and He doesn't call you wicked. There is nothing good in the flesh. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 8, they that are in the flesh cannot, cannot please God. There is no possibility in the verse that you could read it that sometimes they please God. You know, every once in a while, they might please God. Dearly beloved, they not only don't please God, they cannot please God. They don't have the ability, they don't have the power to please God. Now, the contrary to that, is there's nothing bad in the Spirit. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentle, uh, goodness, uh, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. The law wasn't given for a righteous man. It's given for an unrighteous man. So whatever comes out of the Spirit doesn't need any law because it's not unrighteous. Clearly, scripturally, nothing good comes out of the flesh. Nothing bad out of the Spirit. God's children are born by the Spirit. The flesh profits nothing. The Spirit is the one that gives life. We are born by the Spirit of God. Look what it says in Romans. If the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus Romans 8, verse 11, dwells in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Verse 9, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. There is a verse of Scripture from which we all build the same theology. I believe the hireling flees because he's a hireling. I have never, no matter, no matter where I go, I have never had one Christian ever question that he did not become a hireling by fleeing. He fled because that's what he was. It's out of the abundance of the heart that a man the, the, the mouth speaketh. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's because he's a hireling that he fled, not fleeing that made him the hireling. You do understand that a man steals because he's a thief. He does not become a thief by stealing. If he weren't a thief, he wouldn't steal. In Corinthians, I don't want any of you to be deceived. No adulterers, no fornicators will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. Such were some of you. Well, why weren't they all that? I think clearly not everyone is a th the thief. And I, I think one of the characteristics of the flesh is to lambast people who are not strong in the areas in which you are, there are people headed for hell, as sure as day follows night, who wouldn't steal a penny. 
They're simply not thieves. And therefore, they don't steal. And they wouldn't steal. I mean, they'd die before they'd steal. But that doesn't make them righteous. And there will be an area, believe me, in which they're weak. And those are the areas that they're not really all that excited about, about talking about. But they love to boast in the areas where they're strong. Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are cleansed. How? By the Spirit of God. Not by anything that you did, but by the Spirit of God. And we become new creations in Christ Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit, not by anything that we do. A man doesn't steal, folks, unless he's a thief. He doesn't murder unless he's a murderer. So then, does a man have to believe to be a believer? If he doesn't have to steal to be a thief, does he have to, be, to believe to be a believer? Now, the answer, folks, ought to be crystal clear. Nobody believes unless they're already a believer. Nobody steals unless they're already a thief. Nobody murders unless they're a murderer. Nobody believes unless they're a believer. And nobody disbelieves unless they're an unbeliever. And when the Word of God says that they're condemned because they didn't believe, you don't have to believe to be or you don't have to not believe to be an unbeliever any more than you have to believe to be a believer. It isn't the flesh that did any of those things but the Spirit. Now in Galatians, we're told that there, these two natures are in conflict. One of the verses where there is a lament is in the book of Isaiah. Oh, Jehovah, why have you caused us to err from your precepts? Why have us to err? I believe God made us that way. If Adam had not been so created to desire Eve more than he desired God, he wouldn't have done it. Was Adam free to desire God and, and desire Eve? I don't think Adam's desires were any more free than yours are. And there's something that conditions your desires. Folks, there is something that conditions your desires. And what I'm told in the Word of God is that there is a battle, a serious conflict, a raging conflict between flesh and spirit. In Galatians 5, I read, for the, the flesh lusts, it desires, it lusts against the spirit, and the spirit lusts, that is, desires against the flesh. Now I challenge you in, in any way that you translate that, that verse, to come to any possibility, any of all, that there is some remote area where the flesh and the spirit agree. There is no way you can look at that verse and say, well, occasionally the flesh and the spirit agree. No, they never have the same desires. Never. Even though they may look like the same desire. The flesh may desire the flesh, folks, the flesh may desire to give a skyscraper to, to bless and hope forever. Uh, the BHF tower, okay? And the, the spirit may desire it. But if it's done in the flesh, that's sin. There is no synergism between flesh and spirit. They are in constant conflict, one with the other, so that you, aha, okay, there is flesh, there is spirit, and there is you so that you cannot do the things that you want to do. Now, I've spent some time on that verse over many, many years. And for a long time, my conclusion was that, well, what that verse says is the flesh can't do what it wants to do because of the spirit. And the spirit can't do totally what it 
wants to do because of the flesh. You know, and that may be right. That's what I thought it was. I've, I've taught that from the pulpit. I've written that in articles. And that may, it just may be correct. It'd be very, very embarrassing to ever suggest that I might have been wrong. I mean, there was one, there was one time I thought I was, I was wrong. Turned out I was right, but uh, of course I, I grow just like everybody else. But I've come to the conclusion that the you is separate from the flesh and the spirit. Third, third person, third man, okay? You are, I've said this before, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you, as that new creation, cannot do what you always desire to do because of the conflict between flesh and spirit. So let's look at that conflict, that horrible, raging conflict briefly uh, in the seventh chapter of Romans. Romans chapter seven. Now you've probably heard enough sermons and you've probably read enough articles you know, to know that what Paul is referring to in Romans 7 is defeat. And what he's referring to in Romans chapter 8 is victory. And folks, I believe that is a terrible, terrible conclusion to come to that, that just isolates you from marvelous truth. No defeated Christian says, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. That is victory. That is maturity speaking. Paul is not more mature in the 8th chapter than he is in the 7th. And the author is the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit is dealing with is the conflict mentioned in Galatians 5 between flesh and spirit. Now I want you to see in the 7th chapter of Romans, the last verse. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at the last sentence. So then, with my mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now folks, you are not going to change that. I don't care who you are. You are not going to clean up the old man. You're not going to clean up the flesh. And I am persuaded that most of my Christian friends are desperately trying to do just that. Trying to make the flesh clean and acceptable to God. Folks, listen, dearly beloved, what I do every moment of my walk is with the mind I serve the law of God and with the flesh the law of sin. Same, same is true of you. Now in 1 John 1, verse 9, I'm told that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that is the, that's probably a keystone verse of Arminian theology that, that if, you, if you sinned, you're not only out of fellowship, you know, you might be even unredeemed. And if you confess it, then God forgives it and you're back in fellowship. Now, the word confess, and I've talked about this before, is homologeo. It, the word means to speak or say the same thing as another. That's what it means. That's what it means. What has God said about your sin? Well, let's see. He's removed it as far as the east is from the west. He's buried in, a, in the deepest sea. He's, he's washed uh, me white as snow. He's, he's forgiven all my trespasses. Uh, all of them, past, present, future, he's forgotten it. Even if you looked for it, you couldn't find it. Dearly beloved, why don't I go before God in prayer and say, Lord, this is what you've said about my sin. Now I'm confessing how I rejoice in the provisions of your grace, how wonderful to know that it's all covered under the blood. If the flesh cannot please God, And I'm told in Romans 8 that I am, I am not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be, the Spirit of Christ dwells in me. And if He doesn't, 
I'm not God's. And th folks, those are powerful verses. If he dwells in me, I'm not in the flesh. And if he doesn't dwell in me, I don't belong to him. Now, if I don't belong to him, well, then none of this is of any interest to me. It's not a problem. It's, it's, never, it's never the non-Christian who comes to me and wonders whether or not he has a free will or not. It's always the Christian. If I don't belong to God, that settles all the problems. But if I, if I belong to God, then His Spirit dwells in me and I'm led by the Spirit. I'm renewed by the Spirit. In fact, God promised to Israel and, and we as a first fruits of that, we as a testimony of the grace of God, we who are members of the body of Christ have His law written in our hearts. Not the old one, but the new one. Not the old heart, but the new heart. With my mind, I serve the law of God. With the flesh, and at the same time, with my flesh, the law of sin. Those of you who are new creations in Christ Jesus, your only desire is not to sin, is to walk with Christ. Do you then have the freedom to sin? I don't think you have any freedom whatsoever to change your desires. The desires of the flesh are only evil. The desires of the Spirit are only pure, never unpure. Therefore, it is not I that do it, not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now, if you don't understand that, and if you don't grasp that, I, I can't imagine how you have any peace. I don't see how you have any rest. I don't see how you have any joy. Dearly beloved, I think one of the marvelous, marvelous testimonies to the grace of God is the Holy Spirit telling you that it is not you who did it, but sin which dwells in you. I am absolutely amazed at how few Christians are willing to even discuss with one another the possibility that in 1 John chapter 3, the Holy Spirit is agreeing with Romans chapter 7 that whosoever is born of God has no ability to sin. The leading seminaries in the world would tell you that, well, what that verse says is that you can sin some of the time, but not all of the time. And so suddenly this new creation made pure, made sincere, made righteous, Romans chapter 5, is going to go to heaven with an ability to sin. Basically no better off than Adam was. And if Adam didn't make it, well, we, we won't make it. Folks, why isn't the grand truth of the grace of God that you as a new creation in Christ Jesus of a pure heart, a sincere heart, that you are made absolutely and completely righteous and that the sin in your life is the sin that dwells in you? The God I see in the Word of God is working in me both the will and to do of His good pleasure and it is very very difficult for me to conceive of anything touching my life outside of His design. I believe my life is hid with Christ in God, that it is God who's working in me to will and to do of His good pleasure. And out of the mess, out of the horrible mess that I see with physical eyes, there's a testimony to the grace, the love, and the faithfulness of my Heavenly Father. Know that you are loved by God. Know that you are loved by us. We love you. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.